Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking with Hafsa Mansour, one of the creators of First Gen JD, about thriving in law school as a first-generation law student. Your Law School Toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together, we're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking with Hafsa Mansour, one of the creators of First Gen JD, about thriving in law school as a first-generation law student. So welcome, Hafsa. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it is definitely my pleasure. Well, first up, could you tell us a little bit about what First Gen JD is and how it came about? Yeah, so essentially this came from the product of a bunch of frustration among first-generation law students of just constantly feeling like we're reinventing the wheel, and like we're at a disadvantage because there's all of this information that people whose parents and grandparents and you know, are the sixth-generation line of attorneys feel like they already know, and we're struggling to sort of keep up. And so First Gen JD is a website that is meant to be sort of a survival guide for first-generation law students to navigate all of the challenges that being first-gen brings, uh, both in your personal life, but then also academically and through your career. Awesome. And And I was, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask if people are interested in checking that out, where would they find that? Um, It's firstgenjd.com. Okay, perfect. Um, and I was able to found it, co-found it with three of my other uh, classmates through a program at our law school uh, that allows for community engagement projects. Oh, cool. Um, and so uh, my Hamid, Tatiana Lang, and Melissa Walker are three fabulous, uh, fabulous, fabulous people who I was able to work with on this project. Nice. And where are you guys in law school? Seton Hall Law. Nice. Class of 2020. Perfect. All right. Um, well, on that note, actually, Can you tell our listeners just a little bit about your own background? You know, what was your path to law school? What goals do you have for your legal career? That type of thing, just for some context. So I'm actually originally from St. Louis, Missouri. I went to an undergrad at Webster University around here, and I was a human rights and political science double major. Um, And I knew that I wanted to do public interest sort of nonprofit work. I just wasn't sure exactly what path that was going to take. And I eventually decided that international human rights law was sort of where I was looking looking because I feel like the, the law has this great enforcement mechanism of ensuring that civil and human rights are actually actualized. Uh, and so it turned out that my dad's dream for me also was always to go to law school. And so when I combined this passion for international human rights with this idea of going to law school, it created this really beautiful sort of synergy uh, in, in, in Seton Hall, which has this great human rights um, clinic. And that's actually one of the things that really drew me there. Um, so I'm now a 3L, um, hoping to graduate in the next couple of months. Crazy. Uh, <laughs> I know. It's, the, the, it's gone so fast. Um, as a 1L, um, over the summer, I was at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, which is a nonprofit that does policy work around um, voting rights, criminal justice reform, and economic mobility. Um, I was also a judicial extern, and then this past summer, Summer, I was at White and Case, which is a big law firm in New York, um, and I will be going back there after I graduate. Okay, and I noticed on your website there was a really excellent series of posts on getting those big law jobs. So if anyone is interested, we can definitely link to that. Did you struggle, you know, coming from wanting to do public interest work to doing OCI and taking a firm job? I mean, I know with a lot of my friends in law school, that was kind of a perpetual struggle. That was definitely one of my biggest concerns. One, just on the first gen side of trying to figure out what this whole OCI process is and understand what it even is that I'm getting into and what big law even means. But on the other side, I really struggled with this sort of moral and personal dilemma of am I selling my soul for this? You know, we have to pay off student loan debt, support our families, and just pay the bills. And so I felt like big law was at least going to give me the opportunity to do all of that. But I really, really struggled with just the idea that I was 
doing it in the first place because it, I, for my first year of law school, I was really a never big law person where I just thought like, this is not for me. But then once I really started looking at what sort of career opportunities were out there and the idea even of going nonprofit in the, in the long term, the fact that having big law on your resume is a big boost sort of eventually convinced me that that was something that I needed to try first. Mm -hmm. And I'm really fortunate that I found a firm that also believes in pro bono and public interest work. And so I was sort of able to mesh those desires. Right. Yeah, I know it's something that I definitely had a lot of conversations with various friends about that struggle. Um, So what kind of challenges do you think that students who are the first in their family to attend law school, or in some cases, actually college as well, what kind of challenges do they face? And how can they find support and really overcome some of these issues? I think the first piece of it is just understanding what it even means on a personal level to be a law student is such a big struggle. All of the stuff that we've done for First Gen JD was born out of our own struggles and difficulties navigating law school. Um, And I am both a first-generation college student and a first-generation law student, so I know that a big piece of just the entry-level understanding of law school was conceptualizing of myself in that area of the law and really struggling to connect the people who are still my friends and my family with this new environment that is so divorced from anything that's non-legal and trying to sort of bridge those two worlds. And so there's a big uh, struggle, I think, for a lot of law students just trying to navigate those interpersonal dynamics, come, uh, come to terms with the stress and anxiety that the law brings. And so that's a big piece of the website and trying to understand what those challenges are. And then we also try to understand that just the academics of law school are so different from anything that people have experienced before. Undergrad does not operate the same way as law school does. And That, that is outlining, definitely true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, outlining and case briefs is all new to everybody. And then suddenly there's this 100% final exam and everybody's panicking because your entire life you know, seems to rest on this one three-hour session. Right. And then it can be a lot. It's definitely a lot. And then I also think that so I come from a blue collar family. And one of the things that I really struggled with was sort of this idea of professionalism in a white collar background. You grow up your whole life thinking that, you know, you've got this basic understanding of how the world works. And then suddenly you're thrown into this environment that's completely different. And people are telling you that you're eating wrong because you're using the wrong utensils or you, you know, broke the bread in the wrong way, or you put your drink on the wrong side. And it's just this whole new level of etiquette and interpersonal relations that, to me, was just so unmanageable. And I think that really also creates sort of that uh, anxiety around, is this really where I'm supposed to be? Is this something that I can do? And then the fourth piece we sort of talked about a little bit already, which is just this idea that career advice is so niche in the law that you really can't understand, you know, how to get ahead in the law by talking to anyone other than a lawyer. How big law operates doesn't really translate to any other profession. And there are some things that you can do to get ahead, like networking, that's just sort of a universal white collar thing. But but the way that the law promotes certain positions and what sort of qualifications you need is also, I think, a big source of frustration for first generation students who don't know how to find those resources and how to to get ahead and understand all of that information rather than sort of learning it once more for the first time. Right. I think everything you said is completely true Um, and definitely something we've had a lot of conversations about. Um, I mean, I know you have a lot of this stuff on your blog. Do you have other resources that you would suggest people kind of go to? Or, you know, how do you how do you start to navigate that if you haven't ever been to sort of a fancy dinner and suddenly you're expected to go to this recruiting dinner and there maybe are 10 forks and, you know, multiple glasses and you just have no idea where to start? I think the first thing is just to recognize that it's a problem that everybody faces and not assume that it's sort of a one-off, that you're the only person that this affects. And then it really goes to just talking to people. I mean, find your mentors, find people in your law school who have been through the same experience, find other folks in your community who are willing to just be open with you about having gone through these struggles and willing to share how they've overcome it. Um, And don't ding sort of the online resources like First Gen JD, like uh, Girl's Guide to 
law school, like the law school toolbox. There's so much stuff out there, and I think there's always an opportunity to find it if we look for it. Um, and the other piece, I think, is just representation. Just find other first-generation lawyers who have made it. So going even outside of the law school community, but actually to find other people who have been through this, who sort of overcome it in the sense of now they're very successful attorneys and they have all of the resources available to talk to you about and who are more than willing to sort of provide that advice for you. That is excellent advice. Um, yeah, and I feel like almost at this point, you can pretty much Google or YouTube, find a YouTube video on anything. So if there's a specific problem that you have, where it's just like, I don't know what fork to use, well, that's a problem that YouTube can probably help you with or a blog. And there's nothing wrong with not knowing that. It's just why would, I mean, one of the questions that I always found useful to ask myself in these type of scenarios, well, is there any reason that I would know this? Okay, no, like, let's just go find the answer. Um, all right, well, you mentioned, you touched on this earlier, actually. Law can be, you know, kind of a conservative, arguably kind of snotty profession. Um, to what extent do you think law students and young lawyers need to conform to this perception? And how can they balance that with feeling authentic? I think a big piece of it is just recognizing where we sort of have to be cookie cutter law students and where the opportunity to really be ourselves shines. And I think a big piece of that that I've recognized is that there's a difference between the interview and a difference between going to work every day. I think in the law school, for the most part, there's no real restrictions on how you can dress, how you can act, and who you want to be. And I think it's really a time for you to hone your authenticity as you're developing your legal skills. Once you switch to the work environment, I think once you're in the, that interview mode, you need to be as close to sort of what they expect a law student to look like, um, to act like. I know one of the things that I really struggled with was that I was told that when you're dressing for an interview and when you're presenting yourself, that you should look as much like any other law student as you can so that everybody focuses on what you're saying rather than what you're wearing or how you're acting or what you're doing. That was really difficult for me because I'm a brown woman who is also Muslim and wears a hijab. And so there's basically no way for me to look like most other candidates. Right. And that was this sort of sense of like, wow, this makes me more different than everybody else. Is this really what everybody is going to be focusing on? And it was definitely, I think, more built up in my head than maybe it came out in some of these interviews. I'm not saying I didn't have some horrible interviews where people said some inappropriate, you know, racist sort of things. Really? But I think, yeah, we have some interview stories. I think if you ask a lot of diverse law students, they will have at least one sort of interview from hell story to tell you. I mean, I was always shocked, even just as a white woman, the things that people would come out with. And I was just, I mean, in one case, I refused to do a callback because of the situation. You know, the recruiter asked me why, and I told her, and she was, you know, just horrified. But it was like, this is the person you're sending out to do interviews. Maybe you need to, like, not send them or get rid of them or at least talk to them about this. Absolutely. And I think uh, career services offices, especially for OCI, are really sensitive to this. And they work on trying to find people to come to the school and talk to students in a respectful manner. And they're definitely there to, to hear those those comments and concerns. Mm -hmm. But for you, I mean, I assume that you did continue wearing your hijab and people dealt with it. Is that for that? Yeah. And I, was, and I was really fortunate that I was able to find a place where, you know, uh, diversity is very important to them. And so that came through in the interview. And obviously those places that were less than you know, willing um, to, to sit there and interview a woman in a hijab was not a place that I was going to continue to interview or try to find a job. Um, and what I found is that even though there's that expectation that you're a little bit of a cookie cutter in the interview process, that expectation does not continue once you go to work. So you may be in a full business suit during the interview, but you're in business casual every day at that office. And I think that sort of translates to your personality and your authenticity as well. And there's a lot more opportunity on sort of case by case basis to figure out how much you can jive with with that environment um, and how free and willing you're you're able to be to be yourself, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And when you were considering firms, I mean, were there specific things you were looking for? Were you going kind of on a gut feel? Were there statistics? Like, how did you kind of navigate, okay, this might be a comfortable and safe environment for me to be in? 
I think part of it is just the people. Uh, you meet so many people during a callback interview in particular that the way that the office sort of looks at candidates, the what it expects from its attorneys, the way that it treats diversity all becomes sort of apparent. So there is that gut feeling piece to it. But I also know that there's a crazy amount of statistics online about basically every law firm. Um, Vault and AM Law publish statistics every year. Uh, and I was able to look through those to get sort of a feel on how diverse that firm really is, what sort of work they're doing in terms of diversity and inclusion, um, if they have working groups uh, for different affinity groups. Um, and then pro bono is also really interest, uh, really important to me. As I mentioned, um, I really want to be a public interest attorney and do impact litigation. So to the extent that firms are sort of a bastion for that big class action impact litigation, I really wanted to make sure that I found a place that was invested in doing pro bono work, both on that individual sort of client basis, but then also at the impact litigation level. Uh, and again, there's a wealth of information online about that stuff. Let's switch gears a little bit. Um, I want to ask you about something you've got some posts on the blog about, which comes up a lot for people, I think, which is imposter syndrome. So what is this and how can people really deal with it, particularly if they feel like maybe they do not come from a group that traditionally belongs in law school. So the dictionary definition is the persistent inability to believe that one's success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result of one's own efforts or skills. All of which is really to say that it comes from this larger sense of feeling like you don't belong wherever you are. And it's this inability to feel like you deserve to be where you are. And I think that comes out a lot more in students from underrepresented and marginalized backgrounds in the law. It's obviously common among all law students, which is why there's so much conversation happening right now about imposter syndrome in law schools, in law firms, in all sorts of legal environments. But it's really acute in terms of folks who don't see themselves represented in the law, people who don't look like them, uh, or people who look like them to practice the law. And that sort of doubles down on this insecurity and feeling like for some reason, my background doesn't mesh with where I'm at right now. And as a result, I don't think that I deserve to be here. But I think the thing to keep in mind, first and foremost, is that you do deserve to be here. Somebody picked your resume out of a pile of resumes, probably multiple someone's, and thought, this is exactly the person that we want here. Whether that's your law school, whether that's your law firm, somebody said, this person, among all of the other candidates that we found, is the person that we want. And I think that's so important to keep in mind. And that's something that I've constantly had to remind myself as I'm going through law schools, as I'm going through firms, is just understanding that I deserve to be here and multiple people recognize that I deserve to be here. And then on top of that, it's so critically important to find your community, to talk to other people about what you're going through and not sort of hide it as a stigma or a shame. To recognize that this is such a common facet of the community and that everybody is going through the same process. So I think just finding other folks that you can talk to about these issues is like a huge weight off your shoulders. And that's been really important to me and it's been one of the things that has been so wonderful about working on Christian JD is finding that community and helping to create it among other first generation law students. Yeah, I think that's absolutely important. Um, yeah, I read a post like super early on, which is still quite popular on the girls guide, basically saying you've got to find your people, like whatever that means to you. Um, and I think certainly, you know, those opening weeks of law school, I mean, at least my experience was I was sort of looking around and saying, who are these people? Like, yeah. these, are, <laughs> these are definitely not my people, you know. Um, but then, you know, I found the people who were and became really good close friends with them in some cases. But um, I mean, it's a very weird environment at law school. I mean, at least in my experience. Um, <laughs> I had done a, oh, I agree. You know, I'd done a different graduate school and just walking into law school was very, very different. Um, and yeah, on this idea of belonging, I mean, personally, I think, you know, someone who comes from an underrepresented background probably actually has a bigger claim in some ways to belong because obviously it was more difficult for you to get there. But that can be difficult to remember kind of in that moment when you're feeling like, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm, I just failed my midterm and no one around looks like me. And what am I doing here? They've made a mistake. <laughs> it's like, no, they didn't make I a mistake. <laughs> and I think that's why representation is such such an important piece of the law is if you can see other people who've done what you've done, 
then you can recognize that you are as entitled to be here as that person and as a result as any other person in the law. And I really believe in this idea of standing on the shoulders for those who came before you and then paying it forward so that once we've succeeded as law students, it becomes incumbent upon us and it's our duty to then turn around and mentor other students to give them the opportunities that we were fortunate enough to have so that we aren't constantly reinventing the wheel. Right. No, I think that was such a motivation for me in starting the Girls Guide to Law School, too. It's just like, this is something I want, I wanted to have when I was starting law school. Someone to tell me that, like, this is, you're not crazy. <laughs> you know? Like, these things really are happening. Your, you know, your perceptions are correct. And there are people who have survived this and gotten through it, and you can survive it as well. Um, right, because, I mean, you're very open on First Gen JD about you're coming from an underrepresented, marginalized background, I mean, you've even written an article, for example, asking, what does a lawyer look like? Which I think is a fantastic question that reflects on representation in the law. And we've touched around this a little bit, but do you have any specific advice for students from diverse backgrounds for trying to feel comfortable in law school, particularly in our current political climate, which is challenging? That's an understatement. Um, I think, first of all, that article actually came from the same conversation that I was talking about earlier in our sort of dress for success piece where I was told that for interviews I needed to look like everybody else and I just sort of sat there in frustration and anxiety thinking I literally cannot look like anybody did else. People, did people actually advise you, for example, not to wear the hijab? Nobody said that I shouldn't wear the hijab and it was sort of like a group conversation about what are you supposed to wear right. to an interview. So it wasn't directed specifically at me, but I still felt like there was sort of a spotlight on my head because I knew <laughs> that there was just no way that I could conform. Like, there was no way that I could follow this advice. Right, it just wasn't And happening. so in my head, I'm thinking, oh, God, like, what have I gotten myself into? This is not possible for me, and this is your most basic piece of advice that you want me to take away. Right. What am I supposed to do with this information? How do I navigate around it? What does this mean that I'm supposed to do in an interview Am I supposed to, like, apologize for this? Do I have to change? What is what is happening? And so that article, What Does a Lawyer Look Like, was really me struggling with my own understandings of what representation in the law is. Uh, when I was actually applying to come to law school, I had initially almost not applied because I thought, well, I don't look like any other lawyer I've ever seen before in my life. I've literally never seen a person in a hijab standing in front of a courtroom. Hmm. So what do I, like, there must be a reason for this. Hmm. Right. And so I was concerned that if I ever represented a client, that a jury or a judge could potentially hold it against the client. And I was fine with sort of a reckless disregard for my own future, but the idea of potentially threatening somebody else's interests, somebody that I was supposed to represent and do the best for, that was the thing that sort of stuck. And so I was worried that if I came to law school and I became a lawyer, that it would become an impediment, not to my future, but to somebody else's. And I became my own biggest obstacle because I was constantly worried about those sort of what ifs. And so I decided, all right, well, I'm just, I can't do this anymore. Like there's, there's no way that this could possibly be for me. If nobody else has done it, then it's not mine. But I, it was sort of, a, I guess, a process of Googling it and just recognizing that there are other people who've done this. And also, if nobody else had done this, then somebody else clearly needed to be the first. And my dad's dream was for me to become an attorney. So I thought there's no way that if nobody else, was, even if nobody else had done this, I should be the first person to do it. Obviously, that's not true. There are other Muslim attorneys and I've become more enmeshed in sort of the Muslim Bar Associations now that I am a law student. And that's really given me a perspective on representation in the law. But I think part of my dream in becoming an attorney is this idea that if I can make anybody else's dreams, even one more person's dreams, seem more attainable because I've gone to big law, because I've graduated law school, because whatever it is, then I think that is part of my success as an attorney. I have to pay it forward to that next generation. Well, let's turn it around a little bit before we run out of time, because, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about is challenging, both on a personal and professional level. What kind of practical tools do you turn to when it all just seems like kind of a bit much to deal with? Do you have any self-care favorites that you can share with us? 
first of all, never neglect sleep. Sleep is probably one of my favorite things in the world, and it is incredibly necessary to succeed as a law student. So get your full eight hours to the amount that you are capable of doing so while navigating uh, a full course load. Um, but the other thing is just it's okay to treat yourself like a five-year-old. So uh, one of my other favorite things is just ice cream, and it's totally okay for me to tell myself if I finish reading Cram Pro without throwing the book across the room, then I get to have some ice cream. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one who boundaries for myself. Um, and then I guess the third thing is just don't lose contact with who you were before law school. If you were a dancer or a singer or you painted, like keep doing those things. Don't lose contact with your non-legal friends just because your uh, schedules don't line up anymore. Make sure that you're still in contact with your family. Just stay close and true and authentic to yourself as much as you can while you're going through law school. And don't think that you have to change who you are to become an attorney because who you are is important and valid and is part of the reason that you're going to become a successful attorney, not in spite of it. And if people would like to find out more about First Gen JD, about what you guys do, what resources you have, let's just tell them again where they can look. So we are firstgenjd.com. That's first and then gen, G-E-N, jd.com. Great. And that is basically a blog. You have a variety of contributors. Tell us a little bit more about what's available on the site. So we have four buckets of information, um, the academics piece, and then we have the career advice and the professionalism that I was talking about earlier. So one being sort of how to navigate a white collar environment and the other being specifically legal advice or uh, career advice around the law and then we have sort of that personal uh, component that's talking about anxiety that's talking about diversity and what it means to actually feel like you're an attorney and we also have profiles on successful first generation attorneys so that we can see ourselves more as successful attorneys great do you think this will continue after you guys have graduated what's the plan so we're working on building out some more articles um, and trying to get more contributors to work on the site so that we do have sort of that network of people. And we're also always interested in getting more points of view and more perspectives on the site. We're hoping that it continues once we graduate. Uh, I know that our schedules will be busy, though, so hopefully, you know, it'll, it'll keep going, but we'll see what that looks like. Well, either way, it's an amazing resource. Um, I was very impressed, particularly with the article I looked at on... Um, navigating in a fancy table that had you know <laughs> pictures and just every it was very impressive so if you're not sure which fork to use I actually learned some things um so definitely that was one of the better articles I've ever seen on that topic and I think I've even written some so <laughs> it was very impressive um all right, well, thank well you. thanks to the other fabulous ladies who work on the site Melissa wrote that and it's incredible we also have lots of amazing stuff from Mai, who is herself an immigrant um, who came to this country. Tatiana also is a first-generation lawyer and has written some amazing pieces about how to get involved in law school. So please just check out all of the amazing work. Yeah, I think the entire site is actually really fantastic. So highly recommend that people go there. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us. Any final thoughts you want to share with people before we wrap up? I think there's, if I could speak to every first generation law student and just say one thing, I would say that there are two things that you can never forget. First of all, you're not alone. If you are facing a challenge in your law school path, you're not the first person that's experienced it, and you're not the only person that's worried about it right now. And secondly, you belong here. Just because you're facing an obstacle doesn't mean that you're not supposed to be in law school, and a bump in the road doesn't mean that this whole thing isn't for you you are going to be an amazing attorney and these struggles will only make you more resilient. So please keep going and please believe in yourself because this is exactly where you're supposed to be. Awesome. Well, on that note, very uplifting. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me again. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. With that, unfortunately, we're out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app because we'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon.